one way to make a statement of what's happening. And, and things, measuring aggregate properties gives you a very different picture than what happens on the individual level. So with, again, with a scanning technique, we can just hone in on individual vessels. And these are a series of snapshots of what's happening in this vessel. Regions are bright because there's a fluorescent dye. Regions are dark, in this case, because the red blood cell is, um, is, is, is preventing the dye is, uh, from being in the spot. I mean, it's, it's, it's blocking out the dye. Uh, this could be a leukocyte. It could be any kind of cell. And the motion of the cell is just found as you see this uh, uh, dark spot that excludes the dye move to the right. And again, these, these things go right over into a kind of automation. So let's talk about functional indicators, uh, tracking. Okay, so um, I talked about one skin, skin, uh, uh, sort of a skin prep, sort of dorsal skin prep. It might be fun to think of other skin preps. The idea of looking at the, these are the auxiliary nodes, auxiliary lift nodes. Uh, they light up very, very brightly. This was a recent paper that came out in Investigative Dermatology. Um, there's no reason not to think of, of pulling up the skin around one of these nodes and looking into the nodes. Now, the, the last thing I just wanted to bring up here um, is, is what about the problems with, with all the distortions? So I mentioned that nonlinear microscopy has this great advantage because um, if light is scattered away, it just doesn't contribute at all to exciting the fluorophore. And any, any of the light that comes out of the fluorophore that's scattered, you could just you could collect. You could literally wrap the prep in photo detectors. But there's still a problem if there's any kind of index mismatch, um, then in fact light rays through your objective, um, instead of meeting at a single point, if there are some distortions, or particularly if these distortions are not uh, radial symmetric, will meet at uh, different points. So it needs a way, in fact, to correct for these distortions. So this is uh, an area that's, that's being pushed on very hard. So this, is, uh, this particular solution uh, comes out of uh, Naji and Eric Betzig's labs. And the, the idea then is, to, in principle, one could go in with a ray, look at an image due to a single ray, come in with a second ray, look at the image due to that ray, come with a third ray, look at the image due to that ray. And you want to make sure that you get the same image every time. And then you want to correct, in a sense, you want to bend the light, change the divergence or convergence of the light, so you get the same picture for every ray. So um, just, just, just to give an example here, this is a field of cells. This is after the corrections for changing the incident angle of these different rays that are breaking up the image in, into a couple of hundred pieces. And I think you can sort of see very nicely that uh, with correction and without correction, you get, you get far more detail. And even more importantly, this is a, has a gain of about a factor of two to three. So you actually get much more efficiency for your photon. Okay, you want to look at the same cells every day, so your photon budget is critical. So anything due to correct, not just gives you better resolution, but gives you more output photons for input light. So this is something, again, which I think is going to become very relevant, particularly as you're going into lymph nodes. Okay, so the other obvious statement is, um, you know, we talked, um, the issue came up many times, the cells move at one at a time, but do they move as groups? I sort of brought this up, if you could have things labeled with different colors, of course, you could distinguish them with far more resolution. You know, neurons was very nice work by looking at random combination in, in the Cree lock system uh, out of Jeff Lukman's lab. I'm not sure if this is relevant in some way to, to uh, different uh, uh, tumors, right, you know, with their multiple clones. Okay, the, the other thing that I think would be, keeps it coming up all the time, so I, I think I have a lot of one fantasy picture, right, is, this issue of force, right? I mean, force has been so force was so much force was so important. He even started doing experiments in his own lab until somebody came to his rescue. Um, it's come up this morning many times. There are these large molecules, these are coherents that pierce through the membrane. It just might be fun to start to think about doing the traditional trick of tagging the, the carboxy end and the, the nitrogen end, um, the amine end, the amino terminal end with different fluorophores and see if you could change the shape. So that use the change in shape that happen when these things are stressed into sort of a change in interaction between these fluorophores. Right, just, this is a well sort of defined path and it's very, very hard to predict. Okay, so the last, um, have two more minutes or? Okay, so I'm just gonna, get, I'm just gonna end with this sort of last feature. Um, 
we always think of light as, as a way to observe. Okay, but light is not just a way to observe. Light is a way to change things. So some of these are old ideas. I think you can make molecules, in fact, that have bonds that get broken when you shine on light, particularly UV light, and then they become active. And there's this world of so-called caged neurotransmitters. You turn on light, you have a molecule that's inactive. It's turning things to dust, but it's not damaging anything. So, I mean, one thing I mentioned is the idea that if you have a tagged cell, something where you know where to put your focus, no cell, right? So it's a way, potentially, to manipulate tumors. Um, the other thing is, and this may be relevant for getting structure in, in, in tumors, is the idea of using this as a tool for what's called block-based imaging. And I'll, and I'll finish here. So, usually the pictures that you see, the pictures we've seen today in tumors, most of the pictures you see in neuroscience when people talk about structures is you, you take, an, you take an, uh, a region of the brain and you take an organ, right? And then you just show one picture and you say, this is typical, and you make some conclusion. But there's no homogeneity to, to where the neurons are, or the blood vessels are in the brain, much like people talked about the lack of homogeneity in the vasculature. So you really need to reconstruct everything. And you're only going to reconstruct everything again if you have some sort of automated technique. So block-based imaging is an old idea that, that started with human tissue, and it's, it's come back in, into vogue recently because of automation. And it's the idea that you image as deep as you can into your, into your sections, whether it's like photon microscopy or focal microscopy or any technique you can. And finally, you run out of signal to noise. And then you need to come in. If you come in with a knife, you risk shearing the tissue. So we come in with light, which is vaporize everything in front of us. And then again, we just start taking data. And we come in with light, and we vaporize everything, and we take data. And I'll just give you an idea of what you get out of this, and maybe this will work. No matter what you said, you, uh, okay, let's try this. Oh. Oh, okay. So, this is a chunk of tissue, a millimeter thick. You, you know, it's a typical physics experiment. You spend a year building it and take it, spend a day taking data. <laughs> but it's automated. And, um, then you have all the vasculature. We could label different features of the vasculature. These are surface arteries and surface veins, plunging down, supplying blood, removing blood. Um, these are indicators of cortical columns. Come from a third indicator, some people are used to cytochrome oxidase. The point I want to make here is that then we, we can, you can build automation tools, or automation tools have been built in which these are the various um, neurons and non-neurons. Each is labeled separately. Each one corresponds to a center of mass. So you know where every cell is. Okay, so this is a couple of times 10 to the 5 cells. You're not going to count this by hand, but you will count this automatically. At the same time, all the vessels are in fact just turned into vectors. You know where every vessel goes. And I think it's just maybe an important tool to you start to study tumors and you actually want to make a map of how things are growing and progressing and where the blood flow is going. So it's sort of part of this uh, automation package. The student got a little carried away. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna um, just gonna stop there and just uh, thank you. So, where are you building that last application for specifically? We we built it. So we we have an interest in. We have an interest in how neurons control their own blood flow. So in order to do that, we first had to get a plumbing diagram of, of the brain. And, and the re and it's, so just to give a, a, a one minute pitch, the, the reason this is interesting is because just looking at it, you say, oh, you know, it's, it's uniform. But it's not true. The top of the brain is this, is this grid system, much like Manhattan. And in fact, if you go ahead and you could you um, heighten electrical activity at some part. Uh, you actually watch flow get redirected within this network. If you go in, again, with some optical tools and clamp off the flow, you can watch blood get redirected. So it has a resilience, perhaps secondary, to its ability to, to uh, shuttle resources. 
But then there are other places where you have vessels that deliver blood and have blood come back. And in that case, one blockage will actually, that's just such a pretty picture, I have to show it. Okay? One blockage of one vessel will cause a complete loss of a, of a column in the brain. So you're actually sensitive to single vessel defects. Okay, so we built it to understand the basics of blood flow and sort of what came out of this uh, unexpectedly was sort of knowledge how this phenomenon called microstrokes work, where single blockages cause little regions of dead tissue. Okay, so once, because of this, I mean, the importance of this is that it gave us clues as to where the control elements have to be to control the blood flow into cortex. And this sort of tells us sort of where the next set of experiments have to be in terms of neural control. So that was our motivation, right, to so make a plumbing diagram. Yeah, yeah just as a follow-up to that, uh, have you uh, measured the network? In other words, have you measured your know, radii lengths, uh, the, the what's called the scalar structure? Yeah. Dealt every, with it as a network? Everything. Uh, including the flow rates and so on? Uh, OK. We've, we've, and, and in addition, have you done it across different animals? Well, <laughs> if not one. <laughs> okay, we have done this on the surface uh, in gory detail across different animals. And, but as far as the whole brain, we've done this on three animals. And we have all the data for three animals, which we just started to analyze. So again, I, so I whimsically said, oh, it just takes a couple of days to get that much data, but then it takes, um, to admit this, you know, it takes another year or two to make sure you didn't make any boo-boos, like break broken connections. It's, you, it's really, it's really checking the defects. So, um... But I think you need different types of animals. No, I just... Well, no, I don't think that's going to come... It's a fair question. So. Uh, the good news about doing this optically is that we could see the vessels and cells and other features like smooth muscle at the same time, but it's a little slow. The way to do this in a high throughput way is actually to fill the vasculature with, with something that's x-ray dense, like, like barrier, and then uh, get time on the synchrotron. But uh, so you, you get all the vasculature, but you don't get any other cellular complex. But, but have you measured all the, the details down going down through the network? Yeah, you every, every, every one. And can you measure things like uh, how many cells does the average capillary service? Published. Yeah. Fantastic. And, no, uh, you read our and have you, <laughs> just, sorry. have you correlated it with the neuronal network? Ah, okay. Yeah, let me answer that question. So, let me just say something. I think it's going to leave at 6 o'clock. So, answer that question. Yeah, okay. Okay, let me answer that question. There were, just, there were a series of papers published in the 90s that claimed that places where, not so much in the, where the neuronal density went up, which happens in this middle layer of cortex, you got this great rise of, of vasculature. So I think this is the importance of actually measuring from large samples. Okay. That data that data got into every MRI paper, just applying MRI. So that data is not reproducible either by ourselves or by a colleague we're in So in fact the neuronal the, the density of vasculature it's fast, it's fast, cortex throughout the entire depth of cortex is almost completely uniform. Right? Over tens of, of cubic uh, uh, millimeters. Okay, even though the neuronal density will show very sharp peaks. So this could be why, in fact, places where there's very high neuronal density uh, often correlate where you get the first instances of a rise of deoxygenation as seen with uh, fMRI and, and intrinsic techniques. Okay, I don't know if that, that's a, we're pretty sure of our data. Yeah, okay, thank you.